Hi guys, I hope you're all doing well. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video about using black and white in wildlife photography. In this video, we're going to explore how we can use color to make our wildlife photography images more compelling. Now, most of the wildlife photography you see is rendered in color, so you might think there's not much to talk about. Of course, it's easy to take a photo that captures color since that's what our cameras do by default, but it's another thing altogether to take photos that really make use of color to make an image more impactful. Like most of the short videos I put up here on YouTube, this is not intended to be an exhaustive tutorial, but really just to remind you and perhaps hopefully inspire you to make use of something you probably already know about and already may be using to some extent. This is the kind of topic we could spend a lot of time on, but I'll try to keep this one short and perhaps I'll do a follow up in the future. A couple of things to note before we get into some of the basic techniques. The first thing to say is that with wildlife, we typically don't get to control the palette of colors in a scene. The color of the subject and the colors of the background and foreground are usually out of our control. However, when we have opportunities, we can try to do our best to take advantage of the colors that might be available. And this includes going out at certain times when we know there might be certain colors in the sky or when animals might be in particular locations with certain colors or repositioning ourselves when we're in the field so that we capture a certain combination of colors in an image. On the other hand, if we have the right subject, it can be relatively easy to capture an image with some interesting colors. For example, here are two African birds. This is the lilac breasted roller which has an incredible eight different colors. And then we have the African lovebird. Now both of these birds have colors that are striking, to be honest. But these images are nothing more than snapshots or record shots that most people could take. There's no great skill or creativity in capturing or editing these images. What's more challenging is to make good use of color when you have a subject that doesn't have particularly striking colors. The second thing to say is that leveraging color relies in part on editing. Now, some people think that editing is cheating because the final image can sometimes look quite different to the raw file that comes out of the camera. But the truth is that editing or developing your raw images is not only absolutely needed, but it's something that should be thought of as another stage in the creative process. If you're not editing your images, then you might as well be using JPEGs straight out of the camera. And in fact, they will often look better than unedited images, unedited raw images. Raw images will often not look so much like the scene that you saw, and you'll have to edit them to recreate what you saw and what you felt. You will also then have the opportunity, subject to whatever constraints you might have to deal with, such as limitations of editing when submitting to competitions, to go further and make subtle changes in editing that enhance or downplay certain details in an image. You can even go further and change things more dramatically. And while that might not be typically acceptable from a journalistic point of view, it's entirely valid from a fine art perspective. So let's talk about three simple ways to use colors. The first is to use complementary colors to create contrast that can capture and hold viewers attention. You may have heard of the color wheel. The idea is to capture two or more colors that are on opposite sides of the wheel such as blues with yellows or reds with greens. The complementary colors could be between the subject and an element of the environment or you could have a subject that doesn't have a particularly strong color or colors and you have complementary colors in the environment. If you're trying to use these contrasting colors to help strengthen an image, you should remember that any other strong colors in the image, especially those that are not also complementary, will be a distraction. So let's look at some examples. So let's begin with some examples with blues and yellows. So here we have a lioness. Now the rock that she's on takes up a large part of the image. But fortunately, uh, it's a muted color and the texture of the rock is more interesting than the color of the rock. So primarily what we see is the blue and the yellow. And here we have two lionesses and their cubs who were 
moving out at the end of the day to look for a new location to keep the cubs safe. I was very fortunate to spend a whole day, probably eight hours almost, uh, with these, uh, these cubs and, and their mothers. It was a fantastic experience. Here are some bears uh, playing in intense light with really blue sky and uh, water. Now obviously the blues and the yellows you see in the, in the various images I'm showing you are not all the same shades of blues and yellows. Some of these yellows are more orange or brown, for example. Now people, people often think of uh, polar bears as white, but they're really much more yellow than white. And you can see the color of these bears next to the white uh, snow. And in this case, we have blue sky in this particular image. And then in this next one, we have blue ice. And also in the next one as well. Now here's a tawny eagle. And this next image is a yellow-billed kite. And then we have a Cape Glossy Starling. Uh, this was taken during golden hour and also the uh, next image as well. Now here's an example featuring a giraffe. This is an image that I would probably otherwise have thrown away, but it serves as a good example. There are actually three main colors in this image. You have the beautiful complementary orange and the blue sky, but you also have a lot of green. So this is something that I reduced the, the saturation of the green, uh, and then this, that makes it less of a distraction. Uh, and I, I also did the same thing with the green in that image of the lilac breasted uh, roller, by the way. Now here's an example uh, with a brown bear. So we have the same blue and yellow colors, but the complementary colors are in the environment, while the color of the subject, which is the bear, is less interesting by comparison. Although you do have some of that golden light shining on the bear. Now here's a very different example of complementary colors. Uh, we have a warbling white eye, uh, also known as a majuro in Japan, where I photographed uh, these birds. And uh, this bird is amongst the cherry blossoms. And uh, so you've got the pink and you've got the yellow. And these birds are insanely fast, by the way, very difficult to, to photograph. Uh, in the next one, uh, you again have the yellow, which at times can look a little green as well of the bird, uh, but you have uh, not so much the pink, but more the red of the blossoms. And then in this next example, we have a fox that caught a snowshoe hare. And you have the green in the background and the red, which you can see both in the fox as well as uh, in the ground. A second way to use color is to use a single color to catch a viewer's eye. The color could be one that's particularly eye-catching, such as red, or it could be noticeable because of the intensity of the color or the amount of the color in the image, or perhaps the location of the color in the image. As with complementary colors, the single color will be most effective when there are no other color distractions. So here are some examples with greens. This first image is a cross fox kit that I photographed up really close late in the day. This kit came so close that uh, I was shooting with a 400 prime and I had no choice but to crop the image. This next one is a brown bear in a beautiful lush environment with green moss. Then we have a white morph arctic fox with its summer coat in beautiful lush green grass. So these first couple of images were taken at a distance. And then there are a few images where the fox came up really close. And again, I was shooting with a 400 prime and uh, I should have probably changed to a, a, uh, a shorter lens. I can't remember why I didn't do that, uh, but I ended up with these uh, very tight uh, crops. Now we have a black crake in the water amongst grass. Notice also the complementary red in the eyes and the legs. Now here's some examples with yellows and oranges. And many of these, as you might suspect, are shots taken during golden hour with really nice light. So we have a backlit shot of a polar bear mother and cub. 
In this shot, you can almost get a bit of blue uh, from the snow as well. Now we have a couple of uh, images of Maasai warriors taken at sunrise. Now here's a brown bear uh, walking along the beach and you, again you almost get a bit of blue, uh, complementary blue in the mud there. This next image is a Brunix guillemot standing on some floating ice and the, the, uh, the water really did look like that. And uh, same is true also uh, with this uh, next image of an elephant at sunset. It really did look like that. Those African sunsets can be really intense. Here's a bearded seal late in the day. And again, here's another image that you think, wow, that, did it really look like that? And it really did. It's a hippo uh, very early in the morning. And then we have a wood sandpiper in the water. Now here's a few examples where we have mostly yellow grass, but the intense light on, on the grass really helps to, to make things pop. So this first image is of a purple heron. Uh, and then we have a African wild dog. In these next few examples uh, with bears, it's the reflections in the water that really help to draw more attention to the color of the foliage. Now here's a few examples with blue. This is a blue wax bill. So you can see that in this image, even though there's only a small amount of blue, it really pops out right against the, the sort of orange and the brown of the scenery. And here we have a bearded seal. So you get the, the blue in the sky and the, in, the, in the water and in, in the ice. And then we have a few shots of bears with water that all appears to be blue. Now in these next few examples, there's again a single color that makes the image pop, but the amount of the color is quite small. However, you'll see that it really can still make a big difference. One way you may often see small amounts of vibrant color is in flowers that are part of a scene like in these shots with a fox kit. And then also with a brown bear. Now another way that you might capture a small amount of intense color is in eyes. So for example, here are some shots with a Cape Buffalo and an elephant where the eyes show as red in the night. And then uh, we have a uh, shot of an eagle owl uh, and the eagle owl's eyes appear as yellow. And this leads into something about uh, how black and white can help with color. So in, in some previous videos, I talked about high key and low key images. High key images are where there is a lot of white either naturally, such as in a snowy environment, or as a result of purposely overexposing to blow out parts of the image. Low key images are where there is a lot of black, either naturally, such as when photographing at night, or as a result of purposely underexposing to crush the shadows and embrace the blacks. So here's the thing about color and high and low key. Most colors look great with blacks, especially reds and yellows, for example. And almost any color looks great with white. So for example, in these low key images, like this one with a red fox, and then these two with brown bears, you can really see how much it helps to make the colors pop, even though there's not a large amount of color in each image, but that, that black really, really uh, creates a real contrast with the color. Same as with this uh, yellow fronted canary, and yellow is particularly striking uh, when you have so much black. Now here's some high key images of red foxes and a cross fox. And these Icelandic horses don't have particular, particularly striking colors, but they really, again, pop a lot when you have a lot of white in the scene. A third way to use color is to help create a mood. 
tones and temperature of colors can really help us to convey emotions. For example, red is a very exciting, dynamic and energetic color, while blue is very cool and serene. When you capture a single strong color, such as the calming green surrounding this black crake, or the warmth of the orange with this elephant, you're helping to create a mood. One of the obvious ways to use colors to affect the overall mood of an image is to play with the color temperature, and this is probably something you've already tried. You might especially want to do this if your camera didn't capture the white balance of an image in the way you remember it, or perhaps you just want to change or enhance the temperature in some way. One easy slider that a lot of people miss is the tint. For example, in this image of a brown bear uh, that was taken late at the water's edge, uh, late in the day, uh, the original image was quite green, but you'll see that the tops of the grass towards the back of the image there has a bit of magenta. So I, I tried to bring that color into the overall image by reducing the green tint and making it a bit more magenta. And this had a huge effect on the overall mood and introduced some mystery and, and interest into the image. Now here's an ex a example that's sort of quite extreme. Uh, this is uh, in, in terms of changing the look of an image. Uh, in this original image of a brown bear, there's just way too much green. And uh, it's completely different when you change the color temperature and make it warmer and also change the tint a bit to add a bit of magenta. Now you have to be the, your own judge of whether, whether or not you're comfortable with, with such extreme changes. Um, this is quite an extreme change for me, but it also salvages an image that I would probably otherwise discard. So we've talked about uh, only three basic techniques to use color. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, perhaps uh, in a, another video, I might uh, discuss some other techniques. But even with what we've covered, there are a few things that uh, we can also talk about that can help you when you're leveraging those basic techniques. Uh, the first thing I think is that you really do want to spend some extra time in editing, uh, looking very closely at your overall exposure, your white and black points, uh, the highlights, the shadows, and, and your contrast. Those things really play a, um, a, a big role in, in, in how the colors uh, will, will come out in, in an image. And, and changing those things, and then also, of course, uh, changing the colors, uh, or playing a bit with the colors, will really help to draw the viewer's eyes to the areas that you want. You'll also want to spend a bit of time fine-tuning the saturation and the luminance and perhaps even the hue of individual colors so that you adjust things to your taste. You can do this in Lightroom by selecting individual colors or by using the color adjustment tool and selecting a point on the image, which will then allow you to make the adjustments directly on that color, even if it's a mix of, of two colors. And finally, think about keeping things simple. The less you have going on, the more room there is for other elements of the image to shine. So I hope you found this video helpful. I think especially at this time when it's harder for us to get out and photograph wildlife, you can get a lot of value out of spending some time editing. Revisit some of your older images and see how much better you can make them. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, please post below. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.